Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Caroline Elliott. I am Deputy Director of Brunswick Topsom Land Trust and former ED of CREA. And as many of you may know, um, CREA and um, BTLT, the land trust, merged last year. So this is our first year as a merged organization. Um, we're very excited to continue this program with uh, Glenn's help. Um, up here on the screen, you can read our mission. So we now, um, uh, formerly CREA, is operating under an expanded mission, and we're really excited about doing education um, across more properties, because BTLT has a lot of properties in Topsom and Brunswick, um, and has a lot of agricultural programs, so doing education around agriculture. So um, we think it's going to be all to the good. I just wanted to say a little bit about the work that we do. Um, CREA has always run school programs and summer camp for many years, and I'm just curious, um, the youngsters here, um, how many of you have attended either CREA camp or um, uh, experienced our school programs at your schools? So I see a couple of, a number of hands, so that's good. Um, we love doing that work. Um, we do nature-based education. It's very hands-on and experiential. It's, it's learning science outdoors, and that's just the best way to learn science. There's so much cool stuff in nature. Um, the, you know, the outdoors makes for a great class, classroom. Um, the land trust, at the land trust, we also have agricultural programs. We conserve agricultural land. Um, you may be familiar with our farmer's market at Crystal Spring Farm. We have a community garden that has 80 plots and a large common good garden which raises food that goes to mid-coast hunger prevention. Um, we've provided gardening space for new Mainers and for the Wabanaki. We participate actively in the Merry Meeting Food Council. So um, keeping our agricultural landscapes as agricultural landscapes is really important to us, and we're very excited um, post-merger to be bringing more education to our agricultural programs. We conserve land, that's pretty obvious from our name, and we host community events. There was a sheep shearing at our farmer's market last fall that was really fun. Um, we do an annual solstice event at the Labyrinth, um, so uh, visit our website and check out the events that we offer. So I just want to say a little bit about this program. If you're not familiar with it, um, Glenn started this program in partnership with CREA back in, when was it, Glenn? Well, it was 19 years ago. 19 years ago. So. And this is a really unique program. It's very few high school students have the opportunity to go out into the field, conduct research over a period of time, and sort of learn applied science you know, in an exciting outdoor location. Um, so we have been totally delighted to work with Glenn on this over the years. So your students have been going to the Cadence River Nature Preserve in Topsom. It's a 230-acre preserve. If you've never been there, you should absolutely go. There's a beautiful river. It's beautiful in all seasons. Um, our role has been to provide the location, um, the structure. There's the Ecology Center. If you've never been there, that's where we keep our equipment. And um, uh, it's a cool place to visit on Sunday afternoons. We're open from 12 to 2. We have a lot of... Um, main mammal mounts and bird mounts and uh, mineral displays and that sort of thing. So your students have been coming to the Ecology Center weekly for eight weeks in the fall. Um, this is the interior of the Ecology Center. And they come trekking down the road. That's one of our equipment sheds. You can see our highly technical equipment that they were working with. Um, but it's been a fantastic program. Um, I just put up a couple of pictures from this year's class um, so you can see what your students look like as uh, budding scientists collecting data. They seem to be enjoying it. They're all smiling. 
Uh, this is from the, <coughs> the invertebrates sampling. Um, bird watching, bird survey. Um, some got to get up close and personal with our pond. Um, the mammal group, the fish group. Um, so uh, all of the students, the students worked in groups and um, one of the roles that we play is to help find um, community mentors. And so can the mentors who are here raise their hands? I see John in the back, Fred, <laughs> Kevin Doran, Glenn, Rebecca. So it's really a wonderful service that they do. It's a unique experience to work with someone who has a lot of scientific knowledge and can share their enthusiasm. So, um, but they have to come out eight, eight weeks in a row for, um, you know, it's all told it's a good, you know, sort of two hour commitment. Um, and this, this um, program would not be the same without the role that our, our mentors play. And of course, Glenn is really the glue that holds it all together. And Glenn's been doing this for 19 years. And this is his last year because he's retiring. So we're very sad about that. <laughs> but it's really, you know, arranging for transportation, taking your class of students to a 230-acre preserve, getting them organized into eight groups, figuring out the equipment. You know, there are a lot of easier ways to teach biology. And that's not Glenn. He's totally, he has been totally up for the challenge every year. And I think we owe him a huge debt of gratitude for all of the students who he has helped to inspire, you know, a, an ongoing interest in the natural world. So um, thank you, Glenn. And I was excited to just learn that Rebecca Norklin, who has been co-teaching it with Glenn this year, is going to continue the program next year. So that is really exciting. So a quick shout out to Stantec, which is a... Um, an environmental consulting firm based in, well, they're all over the world, but they have an office in Topsom, and they printed out the beautiful posters that our students made, and they donate that um, for us. So we're really grateful to them for that. Um, and they also contribute one of our mentors. So that's all I have to say. Glenn? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, so welcome. Welcome, welcome. It's great to see so many people here and uh, to support all these hardworking students and all the great work they've done with this uh, project. Uh, of course, you've, you know who I am. I'm Glenn Evans, Mr. Evans, and Ms. Norklin. Uh, together, we're working with the students this year, and uh, we had an interesting situation where we had more students than we had space in the classroom, so we had to break it into two sections, and that's why that's set up this year, but it was kind of fortuitous because now Ms. Norklin knows the ropes and she'll be continuing on the, uh, the, uh, the trend next year, continuing on the, the, the projects, which is very exciting. Uh, I know it's a lot of work, it's true, but it's also what keeps me going. It's, it's different every year and if I just did the same thing every year it would be boring and uh, students always come up with new ideas, they, they have new angles. And so even though some of these projects are Similar to other years, there's new angles on them. Uh, for example, the invasive species group uh, hasn't been done in 15 years, and, and we're going to be hearing about that and what the status of plants that are not really, shouldn't be belonging in the preserve or what the status of those are. 15 years ago, they weren't, wasn't much, but I'm not sure what the situation is today, so we're, we'll, we'll find out about that. Uh, the forestry group, the forestry project has been going for 18 years now. Kevin Doran has been that mentor for 18 years. He's uh, uh, now retired. He saw it all the way through his career and he's retired and he still comes back and mentors it. Um, but this year the students said, well, let's, you know, let's take an angle. We had a very wet year this year. Uh, the, the year prior was very dry. How, what kind of impact is a drought year 
versus a very wet year having on this tree growth. We have all this data. Let's take a look at that. So even though they're doing the same basic measurements, they, they've got a different angle they're looking at the uh, trees with. And um, let's see. Oh, and there's, of course, there's other projects that are pretty steady. Uh, for example, there's a group studying the pond near the preserve that uh, the it's the classic little pond near the Ecology Center, and when I say preserves, in the preserve uh, near the Ecology Center that there's always been questions about what's going on with it, what's its status, and um, we continually collect data on that to then see what's going to happen in the future. So it's, and compared to the past, so it's all very important and all that's going to be unveiled tonight. Uh, as we said, it's Korea's longest running program. I will say the first presentations happened in my classroom on cardboard with hand-drawn posters, uh, or maybe printed with a copy machine. It was very basic. There, was only, there wasn't even an ecology center when this started. There was just a dirt road into the preserve, and the bus would take that dirt road, and there'd be branches whapping against the side of the bus until <laughs> the uh, transportation uh, department at Mount Ararat said, you need to get a better way to get in there because we, we don't want the buses getting uh, scratched up. Uh, things have developed quite a bit since then. A uh, lot of good support, as Caroline said, from wonderful mentors who come year after year. And you never know what the impacts of these things are. Last year, uh, one of the mentors from Stan Tech was a former student. She had done a salamander study maybe 10 years ago, and now she's working for Stan Tech, and she helped out with a wildlife group last year. That's Katie Treblecock. So that was... <laughs> So very heartening to see that, and some of these students may someday be working for Stan Tech and collecting data for them. I would love to see that. And when I come back next year and the year following, maybe one of you, I'm hoping at some point when you all graduate, uh, graduate from college, and some of you may go into this field, maybe you'll be here helping out too. Um, we've got lots of, uh, you know, the posters are there. They also have written reports. We're going to be hearing about those things. The posters will be displayed on Korea's website if you want to look close, more closely at them. We also give the, the uh, reports to Korea so that um, I can still call it Korea, can I? OK. Uh, they, so, and that, that will be there for future generations to look at and see and compare things. Uh, so without any further delay, let's hear from the students. Uh, and what's going to happen is they're going to come up and they're going to give a little short introduction about who they are and what they're trying to figure out and what their procedure was and a little bit of background, but they're not going to tell you what they found out. Okay, I told them, nope, you got to let people come around and come to your posters to find out what they actually, what, what, um, what you learned and, and what the final results are, at least at this point. Okay, so... Ms. Northland's going to be introducing uh, groups from her section. I'll be introducing groups from my section. And the first group is actually coming from Ms. Northland's section. And this is Becca Northland. We should give Becca Northland a <laughs> Thank you. Our first group presenting tonight is the students who study the invasive species present on the preserve. And those students are Moth Allen and Liesl McKelvey. I'm Moth Allen. And I'm Liesl McKelvey. Um, and our study was on invasive species at the Cathins River Nature Preserve. Just hold the mic pretty close to your mouth. Please. Okay. Um, the, the study hasn't been done in 13 years, so it was very, there was a lot of potential change that was available um, with where we were studying. And we did, we did see a lot of different things there. <laughs> Yeah, so we, uh, our guess was that there was going to be a spread in invasive species since it's been so long. Um, we weren't quite sure, though, since there is such a big gap in the research, um, and that there may be new invasive species. Um, uh, we focused specifically around the heath um, right there in location A and B, um, which are the same locations from 13 years ago. 
Um, we usually went out with our mentor, Nancy Sfera, um, and went a bit further each day, just trying to identify what was there and count them and determine their density in the area. Um, and we measured some, particularly the Japanese barberry. Um, each day looked very different due to the fact um, you're not going to see new species sprouting up each day. Um, so we did get to look around throughout the uh, throughout not only the heath but other areas of the preserve after we circulated through the heath. We did get through the whole heath, and it was very interesting to see the different the different species that we did find there, what we didn't find, and just see how the heath is out there. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. And, and with all these, if you want to find the final results, you want to go over and check out their poster. Uh, next, we have the mammal group with Brianna, Clara, and Nick. Uh, one student uh, was not able to make it. We actually there are several competing things tonight. Uh, not uh, uh, that's, a, that's a whole other story. I picked February because I thought the sports season would be over and there would be nothing going on. Well, guess what? There's a trip to Quebec grow, going on right now. There's a play practice going on for a play coming up. And there's also a choral concert in Rhode Island that pulled several students away. As a matter of fact, one group lost all its members. Um, <laughs> but we'll get to that in a, in a little bit. But anyway, the mammal group. Thank you. Um, I'm Brianna Eves. I'm Clara Saxton. I'm Nicholas Stoudy. And Lyra Lagavietz also was in our group but could not make it tonight. Our project was about larger mammal activity at the Cadence River Preserve in 2023, and our purpose was to determine how time of day and air temperature affected mammal activity at the Cadence River Preserve. Our hypothesis was that mammals at the Cadence Preserve would be more active during crepuscular hours and in warmer temperatures. Crepuscular means in twilight hours. So we had a very lengthy procedure um, during early trips that consisted of strapping four trail cameras to trees. And we did this with the goal of seeing a diverse amount of mammals. You can see up there on the top left is camera one, and then on the bottom left, camera two. And then by the river on the top right is camera three, and then below that is camera four. And then on following trips after we set the cameras up, we would um, use GPS technology to get out there to the cameras and then remove their SD card to track um, certain data like mammal type, temperature at the time the photo was taken, and um, the time of day the photo was taken. And then we compiled this, tab this into tables and graphs which you can come see after. <laughs> Thank you. That was great, guys. No. Awesome. Oh, boy. Uh, the next group is Lane Folger, Nash Lukenbach, I think that's right, and Camille True, and they studied the fishless pond at the Cat Hans Preserve. So come on up. I'm Lane Folger. I'm Camille True. I'm Nash Luckenbach. Um, so for our research project at CREA, we um, did the fishless pond survey. Um, and so we tested the water quality in four different locations around the preserve. 
Um, so not just the fishless pond, but also areas that have water that um, eventually end up in the fishless pond. So we went to a storm drain and two different culverts as well. Um, and we used four different tests for the water. So we tested the pH level. Um, we took the temperature. We tested the dissolved oxygen level and also the level of nitrates and nitrites. And on top of all that, we measured the average cattail heights around the pond to compare with previous years. And our mentor, David Reed, he wa wasn't able to get here today. He was our professional photographer, and he took care of all the invertebrate study for the fishless pond. So um, when we went to go study, we had a few hypotheses, I don't know how to say it, on what would happen. And since this was done just the previous year, we, wouldn't ex we didn't expect much would change. Um, yeah, that, that's about it. <laughs> Come visit us. It's not on. It is most definitely not on. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's green, but it's not working. Well, I'm just gonna gonna shout. So next we have, we have the forestry group with Errol, Travis, Isla, and unfortunately, Elliot, uh, fourth member of the group, is. Uh, She's in Quebec. She's in Quebec. Okay. Here we go. Hi, I'm Isla. I'm Errol. And I'm Travis. Um, and we studied the um, fern plots, which were, um, they are two plots established at the Catherine's Observe. They're established by the Maine Forest Ecology Research Network, which have been studied for 18 years. They, they're used to measure tree growth in that particular area. It, and we are honored to continue the research. Um, so the purpose was to continue the, pre the studies that had been going on in previous years, which was to measure the DBH, or the diameter breast height, of each tree. So that's like four and a half feet above the ground. And there's a special like, tape measure that we use. And just to like compare it to previous years, and as well as checking the soil, pH, water, um, moisture and temperature. And then our hypothesis was that there would be a greater amount of growth during the wet year and less growth during the dry year. So what year was this year, the dry year was last year. So we followed, we followed the procedure, followed the procedure we got here. We took, we first found the center post of plot one in. We measured each each plot's proper size. We then found the North North Street and evaluated like stats like the species, the status, the diameter breast height, and the damage. And then we put took them all and put it all in like these graphs. Right? We repeated with each tree in the plot and going off in the clockwise direction. Once we reach the center flat, we restrain the soil sample and measure the pH and soil moisture of the soil the tree. The soil the trees were growing in. And then we identified the soil type in the horizons. We then determined the slope and aspect of each plot and in each step plot two. Yes, and once we evaluated our data, we found some really interesting results that we were not expecting. So we would love to share them with you. <laughs> okay, next to the birds. And uh, Jesse, oh, yeah. holding up a fort for everybody. Uh, Caleb Edwards uh, is in Rhode Island. Hopefully, good to get that performance tonight. Uh, no, Mike. Yeah, that's it.
Oh, this is small. Very small. Well, uh, hello everyone, my name is Jesse Backer, and uh, my partner Caleb Edwards could not be here today. But I did birds, and basically, well, our problem in question is like, how did the, like, the number of bird species and the number of birds in general change throughout the fall at the preserve? And then also, like, whether the second question is like the bird size and how that kind of like affected the migration. But one of our, one of our hypotheses, hypotheses was um, kind of like that the number of birds and the number of species would kind of go down throughout the fall uh, because of migration. And then that the, the larger birds will migrate later in the season compared to the smaller ones because they're just bigger and they have more body mass. But the background information, I could tell you everything that's up there, but the birds, there's only so much to say. They have wings, they have feathers. Um, and then the, a little bit about migration is that not well, not all birds migrate, only like only some, but a lot of them go down south because it's warmer and more food. Then a procedure, we might have the easiest procedure, we walk around and look for birds. We had a binoculars and then we would write it down. But is there anything else you want me to tell you? Uh, the next group to present is Juliana Allen, Emma Berry, and Ava Hansen, who studied fish in the Cadmans River. I'm Eva Hansen, I'm Juliana Allen, and we are the fish survey um, group. Um, in this research project, we went out around to different areas of the Cadence River and we saw like what affected where the fish were going to be and like what different species we were going to catch. Um, some abiotic factors that we studied were water temperature, pH levels, oxygen levels, and water depth. Our hypothesis was there would be more fish in still deep water than shallow water. And another hypothesis we had was the abiotic factors would affect where and when we were going to catch the fish. Um, on a normal day when we arrived, we would gather the supplies we needed to uh, fish and walk down to the three, we fished from three spots. <coughs> on the map up there, you can see the three spots we fished from. Uh, we really only caught fish from Chub Hole, which was the center one with the pink dot. And we always set a minnow trap, but we never caught anything. <laughs> um, yeah, we used bait. The bait we used was worms, and we caught everything with fishing poles. Um, so, in conclusion, we caught about 19 fish, which unfortunately is less than what the last crew caught last year. but. We did find a new species of fish, which was a bluegill, so I thought that was a pretty good find. Um, water depth and temperature did have a role in like how many fish were caught. So when temperature was higher, we actually caught more fish. But then when temperature started dropping, we caught only about one fish. And then for water depth, we noticed that when the water was about 35 centimeters, we caught most of our fish. And funny story about that is one time there was two members that weren't even there, and then somehow we caught ten fish in one sitting. <laughs> so that was really fun. And another funny story is, um, unfortunately, we caught more trees, it seemed like, than fish. <laughs> um, and a couple other times we accidentally caught our fingers, so that was very fun. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Emma, was there a little competition? Emma, was there a little competition between you and your brother in terms of the number of fish caught? No, it's okay. That's okay. <laughs> her brother was in the fish group class. <laughs> All right. So um, anyway, next next group is the tributary study with uh, Ian, Bryce, and Marshall, and unfortunately, Catherine Kelly is another Quebec casualty. So anyway. <laughs> 
Let's hear from these guys. Thank you. Hello. 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 Um, Catherine's not with us, as Mr. Evans said, um, and neither is the projection. <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, the purpose of this project was to figure out whether or not the Highland Green housing yards was affecting uh, the tributaries around it, and if so, how? Can do. Um, a tributary is a uh, small stream that flows into a river, and a uh, a stream is a small channel of water. And, uh, you know, a, a tributary that flows year round or perennially um, is that that's the kind of tributary we were, st <laughs> we were studying um, this year. Um, uh, so I'm going to be talking about our procedure. So we took the whole tributary and we identified five reaches. And a reach is like a section of the tributary which have common characteristics. So we broke it into five sections. And then for each one of the sections over the course of a couple of weeks, each week we took uh, samples of the water. We looked at pH, dissolved oxygen, uh, water, how clear it is, um, nitrogen level, nitrate levels, and water temperature to determine like with like the stuff in the water, determine how healthy the water was. And then we also were looking for macroinvertebrates in the water, which then we looked to see how pollution tolerant they were to help determine how healthy the uh, stream was. And our hypothesis was at the beginning if or that the uh, runoff was affecting the tributaries in the environment around it. Um, and that's probably it. Already. All right. Um, this last group is, was actually with with Ms. Norklin. Oh, well, you really have to talk right into it, don't you? Uh, and unfortunately, this group got totally swept away by the choral concert. I think, are, are all three of them? All, all three of them. So, but this is just an amazing study, and, and Fred uh, has been shouldering this for several years now. He's actually, you're a retired uh, professor at a, from Florida, Florida University, uh, or a university in Florida. Yeah, I, but anyway. He, uh, he's actually working on this. You're working on this to make, uh, actually, to try to publish something, right? We are going to publish on this. Yes, we are. So, so I'm holding down the fort for Finn and Ryan and Ash. And this project has been going on since 2018. When I first started with the group, I was just basically doing logistics for CREA, making sure all the equipment was available and everything. That was until I encountered this incredible 12-acre poor fen that they call the Heath. And as soon as I saw it, I knew that this was ripe for some research. So I started looking into it and found out that there was absolutely no information anywhere about the formal diversity of higher plants growing on a system like this. And I thought that would be a perfect project to get students involved in. So that's what I did. And we set up a sampling scheme that involved putting a transect out from a certain spot and then randomly assigning one meter squares along this transect. There were 10 of them randomly assigned and then counting all the plants that happened to be in them and determining diversity from that. Now it turns out that there are roughly 50 potential species of plants that could be growing on a fen like this. There are about 30 known to grow there. In our sampling scheme, we found no more than 15 species. And as it turns out, according to the formal definition of diversity, only between four and six are functionally 
significant on the entire area as far as we have sampled it, which is really quite low. Now, the, the system is very acidic. That's one of the characteristics. The sphagnum moss, which forms a mat on the surface, is capable of creating very acidic conditions that most kinds of plants just cannot tolerate. So the plants that are there are very well adapted to these acid conditions, and that was one of the hypotheses that the students had, that there might be a relationship between the diversity in any given place and what the acidity was in that spot. Lo and behold, they discovered there's no relationship at all. <laughs> there is one unusual situation we encountered, and that is there's a stand of a particular kind of grass-like plant called water sedge that is growing on one portion of this fen that depends on higher pH, that is less acid conditions, and it grows out to a point where the acidity falls off by about tenfold, and then it quits right there, just like you drew a line right across, and that's the end of it there, and then it goes on to all the normal plants that you would find in this place. So those are the major findings, and as I said, we are going to publish on this, and all the students from 2018 up through whenever we finish, and, and I think next year might be the last time that we do this, are all going to be on the paper that we write for this, and that will be uh, their first exposure to becoming scientists. Whether they become scientists as professionals or not is immaterial. They are technically scientists, and they will have their names out there in space. <laughs> so that is that. If you want more information, I'm going to be around the poster, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah, so, so I guess we, you had mentioned about the, uh, the goodies up here, but I know the different people, well, first off, the students are going to be at their posters, and we hope you all get a chance to walk around and find out what the results were from each of these wonderful groups and their projects. But I know some students may need to cut out a little early, and there are some things here, some gifts from Kenneth's River Education Alliance that each student should come by and make sure they pick up. Uh, there are some mugs and some t-shirts, and I guess they have a choice on what Either they want to take. Either one, one or the other. All right. And Caroline, is there anything else that needs to be said? Okay. Well, time to learn more and uh, congratulate these wonderful young scientists on the awesome work that they've done. Let's give them a hand.